Hello, my friends. I'm Andrew Fantasia. Welcome back to the countdown to James Bond 25. As usual, if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and give some love to that subscribe button as well. Actually, wait, I lied. Don't give me a thumb. Give me a finger. A gold finger. Let's get started. Welcome back, everybody. I apologize for that Goldfinger joke. They can't all be winners. We're talking about Goldfinger today. This movie was released in 1964, and it made waves. This was what really created the absolute hype of the James Bond franchise. The first two movies did very well. People loved them. But Goldfinger was where this series became absolutely blockbuster in proportion. After this, everybody in the world was talking about Bond. The plot of this movie revolves around our villain, Auric Goldfinger. He's a bullion dealer who profits by smuggling gold into countries where it's worth more and then selling it. Of course, this is illegal, but they can't figure out how he does it. So James Bond is tasked with finding out how the gold is smuggled. Sounds pretty simple and straightforward, but then things take interesting turns. We'll get there when we get there, but I will tease it by just saying this might be one of my favorite evil plans in the entire series. For our opening song, we have one of the most famous James Bond songs, the Goldfinger song sung by Shirley Bassey. Shirley Bassey currently holds the record for the most James Bond songs. I think she's done three movies now. And I don't know about you, but this is not my favorite James Bond song. It might be the most shrill vocals you will ever hear in your life. You can't listen to this song loudly, kids. Shirley Bassey's voice is powerful and she uses it to the extreme. Though it is fun to hear this very talented singer just wail and caterwaul about an evil German man who will seduce women and then touch things and turn them into gold. It's it's kind of silly. There are a lot of series firsts in Goldfinger. This really did set a lot of the precedents. Chronologically, we have our first tangential cold open. About half of the James Bond movies have cold opens that relate to the plot you're about to see, and the other half just have tangential things that don't have to do with anything. They're just a fun little slice of mission that we get to see James Bond doing before he comes back to MI6 for a debriefing and to get his next job. This cold open just involves 007 destroying a drug lab. That's about it. He just blows up a drug lab and then he's like, well, mission accomplished, and then we cut to the credits. Another series first is our first appearance of the Q brand laboratory. This is the lab underneath MI6 where Mr. Bond gets all of his swanky gadgets. We're gonna see this lab a lot over the coming years, particularly in the 90s, because any excuse the 90s got to show technology, my god, did they ever take advantage of that. We also get our first appearance of a villainous death trap, as Dr. Evil would say, an easily escapable situation involving an overly elaborate and exotic death. James Bond villains are all about that, but this was the first time we actually saw it put into practice. More on that later, though. A sad tradition that begins in Goldfinger is this is our first instance of one of the Bond ladies being killed by the villain. This is a very unfortunate thing that tends to happen in these early Bond films, is they will introduce a Bond lady, but then the villain will kill her, and Bond will be like, well, I'm mad now, and then he goes after the villain, and while going after the villain, he meets another Bond lady and just sleeps with her. Again, aging well is not one of James Bond's strong suits. This is also the first time we get a Bond villain who is unaffiliated with Spectre. Spectre was all over the place in these early Bond years. Ian Fleming's books were rife with Spectre agents, so they wanted to use it whenever they could. Goldfinger, however, is not part of Spectre. He's an independent bad guy. He's doing his own thing for his own reasons. Finally, this is the first time in the series that Mr. Bond actually says the words, shaken, not stirred. The medium dry vodka martini shaken, not stirred is famous now for being the drink of choice for Agent 007. But in the first two films, he never actually orders the drink out loud, at least never saying the famous shaken, not stirred line. Other characters have said it. Dr. No actually says it while offering Bond a drink. But this is our first time we get to hear Bond himself say the words shaken, not stirred. It's a little bit of cinematic history being made. When it comes to gadgets, it does not get more quintessentially Bond than this. Because folks, Goldfinger is the movie 
that gives us the gadget of all gadgets, the toy that I think every single James Bond fan wished they owned, the Aston Martin DB5. Ooh, baby. That is a sexy, sexy car. James Bond's Aston Martin is one of the most famous cars in cinema, and this puppy is locked and loaded with, among other things, rotating license plates, smoke screen, oil slick, machine guns, retractable buzz saws in the hubcaps, and an ejector seat for those long, long drives when your passenger starts to overstay their welcome. This beauty shows up in many more James Bond films. It is a classic piece of Bond lore, but this is our first time seeing it. Oh, and Q also gives James Bond a homing beacon, but honestly, the Aston Martin totally overshadows this. Let's meet Goldfinger's ladies, of which there are three. First and foremost is Jill Masterson. Jill Masterson was working for Goldfinger. She was helping him cheat at cards because Goldfinger's kind of a sore loser. And then, of course, James Bond swoops in and seduces her and gets her to turn on her master. So to get revenge, Goldfinger arranges to have her killed. But the method of death is one of the most iconic images in James Bond history. Jill Masterson is killed by suffocation. Her whole body is covered in gold paint. Back when the movie came out, this became a very big deal. This was a buzzed about scene. They allowed the press to come take pictures during the filming of this for promotional purposes and people could not stop yakking about it. Oh my god, there's a lady who's covered in gold paint. It's insane. It truly became this over-the-top phenomenon at this point. It was no longer just a bunch of gritty spies running around with guns. This was something akin to true comic book super villainy, but the public was eating it up. See, even back then, people basically wanted Marvel movies. <laughs> With Jill Masterson dead, Bond goes after Goldfinger and eventually bumps into Tilly Masterson, Jill's sister. She wants revenge. She wants to kill Goldfinger because he killed her sister. Unfortunately, she doesn't get the chance. She's not a very good shot with the sniper rifle that she carries around. She gets entangled with James Bond's plans to figure out what's going on. And after a tense chase scene, she gets killed by Oddjob, who snaps her neck with a flick of his razor-tipped bowler hat. Then finally, there is the primary woman of Goldfinger, Miss Pussy Galore. And yeah, that's actually what they called her. Played by Honor Blackman, Pussy Galore is the personal pilot of Goldfinger's army. She commandeers his private jet, his private helicopter, but not his privates. Yes, we know the villains of these movies sometimes like to collect women like some kind of twisted brothel, but Pussy Galore was not that kind of lady. More on this later. There's a lot to unpack with Pussy Galore. She is a cool character. She is very memorable. However, something happens that is really uncomfortable and just goes to show how problematic a lot of these movies have become in today's day and age. The villains of the picture are some of the best villains in the entire franchise as far as I am concerned. First and foremost, there's one of the greatest henchmen ever put to the silver screen. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, odd job. You may know him as the character that your cheap, dirty friends like to pick in GoldenEye 64 every single time. But Oddjob has a much more rich history. He started off as the henchman to end all henchmen. He works for Auric Goldfinger as his hired muscle, his caddy, his butler, and whatever other odd jobs he needs to do. Hence the name. The backstory of the character is a little bit murky, but apparently he was a professional Korean wrestler who came over to Europe, started a new life. He is mute, he never speaks, so he's just sort of the ideal servant for somebody on an ego trip like Goldfinger. Oddjob's hands are so strong he can crush a golf ball as if it was an eggshell, and he throws his razor-sharp bowler hat with enough precision to decapitate a marble statue. But the reason I love Oddjob so much is because he does all of those aforementioned terrible things with the most charming, affable smile on his face. I want to be friends with this guy. He would probably crush my larynx in a second, but he would be so charming doing it that I wouldn't even care. Look at him. You, you just want to shake his hand and, and, and sit down and have a drink with him and be like, Hey man, what's up? Tell me your tale. Oh wait, you can't speak. Write me your tale. We'll play charades. I don't know. 
Then you've got the man with the Midas touch himself, Ulrich Goldfinger. The German actor who played him, Gert Frobe, is doing a fantastic job. I think acting-wise, this is one of the best performances given by a villain in the whole series. But here's another strange fact. Remember how I talked about how a lot of people in these early movies were dubbed over? Goldfinger was dubbed over as well. Gert Frobe has a very, very thick German accent, and apparently the producers were not happy with it, so somebody else dubbed over him with just a slightly less German accent. I don't know, I would have just preferred to hear Gert Frobe because the guy just does such a great job. When you watch this movie, just pay attention to what this man is doing with his face, with his body language. I love watching Gert Frobe work. I also love watching Goldfinger work because like I mentioned at the top of this video, his plan might be one of the best plans in James Bond history. Here's the skinny. He owns a whole bunch of gold bullion. He is one of the foremost bullion dealers on the planet. Now he has this whole operation in mind that involves breaking into the gold reserve at Fort Knox. We all know Fort Knox is the biggest gold reserve in North America. There is over $10 billion worth of gold sitting in Fort Knox in 1963. So imagine how much gold that is if it's worth $10 billion in 1963. Goldfinger's plan is to go in there, but he's not going to steal the gold. No, 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 that would be much too labor intensive. Instead, he's got something more nefarious in mind. Goldfinger has purchased an atomic dirty bomb off of an Asian terrorist. He plans to insert that bomb into the main vault in Fort Knox and set it off. This would effectively irradiate all of the gold in the U.S. Treasury, making it deadly to come into contact with and therefore driving down its value. The amount of radiation in that dirty bomb would keep that gold irradiated for 58 years, which if you do the math means that today in 2020, the gold would still be radioactive and unusable. In fact, 2022 is when it would finally be safe to handle again. Since that gold wouldn't be worth anything, all of a sudden, Goldfinger's own supply of bullion would skyrocket in value, making him disgustingly rich. And this is a man who already owns his own pilot, his own stable, and his own odd job. That is one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my life. It is so cool, it almost makes me want to turn to a life of crime just so I can think up cool shit like that. Yeah, there you go. What's great about Goldfinger too is that he really sticks to the gold theme. He is obsessed with gold. He drives a Rolls Royce Phantom 337, which is colored gold. He has a gold revolver, a gold putter. Even the cars that his random minions drive have gold headlights rather than white ones. There's just all these subtle little traces of bright yellows everywhere Goldfinger shows up. Just to let you know, you're in his domain. Goldfinger is also the first villain to really set Bond up into a bunch of overly elaborate and exotic deaths. The first of these being the laser table. And what might be the most famous James Bond death trap ever, you might have seen it parodied in The Simpsons a bunch of times, James is strapped to a table and a very powerful industrial laser slowly starts making its way up the table, dangerously close to his little James Bondies. How he gets out of this situation I'll leave for you to discover, but I will say it's not quite as creative as how The Simpsons did it. Eventually Goldfinger just settles for a much more blunt death trap and simply handcuffs James Bond to the atomic bomb. Less complex, but effective. Now it's time for the best quote of the movie, and that best quote has to go to my man Goldfinger. This takes place during the scene where Goldfinger explains his master plan to James Bond, and it's the revelation of what is going on that makes this line so powerful. I want to make sure I get it right, because there's a lot of math involved here, but it is well worth it. The two of them are sitting at a table drinking ice-cold mint juleps, and Goldfinger is explaining what his grand plan is. James is sitting back, he's trying to figure out what the end game is, he's doing the numbers in his head, and the following exchange takes place. Fifteen billion dollars in gold bullion weighs ten thousand five hundred tons. Sixty men would take twelve days to load it into two hundred trucks. Now at the most, you're gonna have two hours before the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines move in and make you put it back. To which Goldfinger replies, Who mentioned anything about removing it? The julep tart enough for you? Just the look on Gert Frobe's face, the look of satisfaction where he gets to reveal this big plan to James, then he just takes a sip of his drink and asks if it's tart enough. That is just pure badass 
villainy. I love it so much, but I'll tell you what I don't love so much. That would be the most sexist slash racist moment in Goldfinger. And oh boy, this one is bad news. Yesterday in the video for From Russia With Love, I mentioned that Ian Fleming, the writer of the James Bond novels, has a particular aversion to gay people, specifically gay women. Ian Fleming was not a fan of gay women at all, and he tended to write them into his stories a lot, because damn, the guy had some insecurities he needed to iron out. Our main leading lady of the picture, Pussy Galore, is implied in the movie and stated in the book to be gay. She trains a bunch of young female pilots, and it's implied that she has relations with them. This is why there's nothing sexual going on between her and Goldfinger. She just works for him as a pilot. She's a professional. She's not interested in him in that capacity. She likes women, plain and simple. Well, that's not good enough for Ian Fleming, and therefore, it's not good enough for James Bond. In what might be the most uncomfortable moment of this whole series, and that's saying quite a bit, James lures Pussy Galore into a barn, they have a little bit of a disagreement, and they start doing judo flips on each other. Eventually, James judo flips Pussy onto her back in a pile of hay, and then forces himself on top of her. Now, in any corner of the real world, here's what would have happened. Pussy Galore would have pushed him off and either kicked his ass or ran away. Either is a valid option. However, because this is an Ian Fleming story, they decide that Pussy just can't resist Bond's charm. He forces himself onto her, and eventually she just succumbs and lets it happen. And the next morning, he has literally screwed the gay out of her. She is straight now, and she's also no longer working for the bad guys. Because of this, she helps James foil Goldfinger's plan. Ian Fleming, you had all the issues, sir. All right, let's move on to my final thoughts. We get a nice travel-heavy Bond film here. We get to visit Miami, Switzerland, and Kentucky all throughout the film, and they all look gorgeous. Kentucky in particular, just like the color palette of it is magnificent. It reminds you that you're watching a 60s movie in the best possible way. We also get Felix Leiter, who's back for more. He's played by Felix number two, Cease Linder. Cease Linder is the oldest Felix Leiter we've seen. I think it's the oldest we will ever see. And that man's age is going to flip-flop as the series goes on. It's also notable that the film ends with James having sex underneath a parachute. Now, of all the places James Bond has had sex, I think I gotta say, underneath a parachute might be be the coolest one? I'll leave that up for you to decide, but that has been Goldfinger, one of the most iconic James Bond films ever made. This really set the stage. It's just every James Bond cliche packed into one movie before it was cliche. When people quote James Bond, they're usually quoting from Goldfinger. When people parody James Bond, they're usually parodying Goldfinger. Just look at Random Task from Austin Powers. That's odd job, baby. It doesn't get more classic than this. Yes, at some points it doesn't get more offensive than this, but you gotta take your lumps. Anyway, that's it for Goldfinger, but come back here tomorrow. We will take a look at the fourth James Bond film. Be sure to bring your scuba gear because you will get wet. See you then.